Well, thank you very much for your <laughs> wonderful introduction. Let me just go to slide number one. Of um, all the introductions I've received in my life, this has clearly been the uh, uh, most recent. Um, <laughs> I'm also really pleased to address all of you. Uh, the talk will come in two pieces. Number one, what can you do without planning? And, and number two, what you do when you're forced to do some planning. Uh, but I openly admit that the level of sophistication of my work lags by a large margin the level of sophistication of your work. So I'm really open to any suggestions how to do a better research. Um, I'm telling you uh, today about work over the last couple of years in my lab at Stanford, uh, a, a set of competitions I was involved in. And I've uh, put a lot of emphasis on the planning part so you can understand what we're doing on, on, on planning for navigation. Let me start uh, historically uh, with the uh, DARPA Grand Challenge uh, that was basically conceived by the US government in 2003, six years ago, uh, as a way to accomplish something that about $500 million of, of funding had not accomplished, which is building self-driving cars. So instead of giving uh, research money to places like uh, General Dynamics and, and research universities like Carnegie Mellon, um, the government decided to actually issue a prize, a million dollar prize, for uh, the team that could actually build a car that could drive itself uh, through the Mojave Desert. This was certainly not the first competition ever. There's a huge number of past competitions, all of which are more significant than our work, uh, starting with the uh, race for the South Pole in 1911, uh, flight across the Atlantic, uh, globe around the world, uh, X Prize, and then finally Stanley. And what you see, there's a constant shift away from people in these competitions all the way to technology. So what we claim is this is the first race where people played no role anymore and all the work was done by the autonomous vehicle. It's actually the first truly large-scale autonomous robot competition uh, that I'm aware of. Um, the competition was basically to drive all the way from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. Um, eventually, they settled for Barstow just because there's too many people in Los Angeles that could be hit by autonomous robots. There's almost no people in Barstow and they went to Prim, not to Vegas. But the uh, type terrain that these robots had to navigate is shown over here. These are well-formed desert trails that are unpaved and have all kinds of hazards. The race was about 150 miles long. Uh, it was specified by a set of GPS uh, breadcrumbs that would specify the course for you. And all you had to do is stay on this course, uh, as shown over here, and make sure your car doesn't get off course. Now, the first race, um, as you probably all know, took place 2004, ended up uh, disastrous. Uh, of the 15 or so teams that finally were allowed to race, uh, none made it anywhere close to finishing. In fact, uh, the closest any team would come would be about seven miles, which is about 5% of the total race distance. Um, this, some of these vehicles were homebrew vehicles. Um, a lot of work went into hardware. Others were conventional pickup trucks, as I'll show you in a second. Um, these were all autonomous vehicles. They were programmed to follow these waypoints. Um, one of the teams uh, forgot to load the waypoints, so the robot tried to go back to Indiana. Um, this is a uh, Silicon Valley entry, a company that otherwise specializes on subwoofers. Uh, they hit a rock and, and weren't able to move further. These guys, as the defense contractors, they hadn't uh, debugged its uh, control software, so this thing actually flipped over right over there. Conveniently, DARPA cut this out of the movie. The uh, largest entry at the time was uh, a uh, military truck. Um, this thing weighs 30,000 pounds. It had a little bit of a, a backup problem. It backed up more than it moved forward. Um, and then the uh, smallest entry uh, that came up uh, was from uh, a university in the Bay Area that competes for Stanford, known as UC Berkeley or Cal. Um, so you can see uh, my friend Anthony Lewandowski doing his uh, motorcycle. <laughs> so I asked, I asked Anthony, um, hey, um, this looked great. What's your goal for next year? And he said, oh, I'm going to double my performance. <laughs> Uh, the government moved on to double the prize money. Um, and from the 106 teams that had signed up for the first competition, we now got 195 teams signing up for the second competition. Uh, so there was a time when Stanford decided to enter uh, based on my postdoc, Mike Montemello, who did a lot of the work. Um, now, so the story goes, I, I had no research money. So normally, you get money from the government to do work. This was a competition. So I couldn't really pay my students to do the work. So what I did instead is, as a Stanford professor, I uh, issued a class. CS 294, Protest and Artificial Intelligence. And instead of paying my students, I would give them course credit. In fact, they would pay tuition for taking my class to receive course credit. <laughs> I love the business model of universities. 
Um, we got Volkswagen to donate a car to us. We put a computer system in the trunk donated by Intel uh, and then had a uh, drive by wire system. You can see this big red button over here is the emergency uh, stop uh, button that, that renders control back over uh, to the human. It's basically my lifesaver. Um, we put all kinds of sensors on the vehicle's roof. Uh, they come in multiple groups. One has to do with your uh, proprio uh, perception and understanding where you are, like GPS and inertial measurements. And the other one has to do with environment perception, which I'll tell you about in a second, lasers and cameras uh, to understand where the obstacles are. Um, a very simplified diagram on how to do obstacle detection with a laser. This is a SIG laser rangefinder that scans with a single line, uh, scan line, uh, the road ahead. Um, Imagine the center being pushed uh, as the vehicle moves forward uh, and, and uh, measuring the road surface. Any vertical obstacle will end up uh, yielding points in this data cloud that are vertically aligned, and those can easily be flagged as obstacles. Um, planning, this is my only slide on planning for the first part to just show you how unsophisticated we were and are. Um, instead of doing any planning, we treated driving as a reactive problem, and all we did is ask ourselves, uh, what are the possible nudges we can give to the steering wheel to move around obstacles? So we would roll out a discrete set of trajectories, about 10 times a second, and just check which ones were meeting a series of, of objective constraints, which is uh, avoid collisions with obstacles but stay close to the road center, and just pick the one that was most, uh, uh, high, most highly scored. Important is also controls. Uh, once you pick your trajectory, you need a controller. You can't do this without a controller. So our controller was a very simple controller, which in essence did the following. Given a reference trajectory, maybe what your planner devises uh, as an output, um, in uh, the ideal mode, it would point the front wheels to be exactly parallel to the reference trajectory, which means in expectation you stay on the trajectory. But in cases where we were off the trajectory, we would measure cross-track error and then steer in proportion to this cross-track error. So we oversteer back to the trajectory. We wrapped around this what's called a PID controller, which is slightly more sophisticated, but I'm sure you get, you get the essence of this. So we started uh, driving uh, back in 2005 uh, at Stanford. This is um, the roof of the medical parking garage, a nice open space, very GPS accessible. Uh, we emulated uh, desert obstacles with these little paper boxes, and you can see them show up in the display over here. I should say this uh, place was usually full of cars, all the medical doctors parked there. So what we, what we did is we would do experiments between these cars, and every time someone picked up his car, he would ask us, what are you guys doing? And he would tell them. So very quickly, no one parked there anymore. We had this entire <laughs> place for ourselves. Um, tell you something more about actual desert driving uh, and some of the perceptual things we had to do to make it work uh, back in 2005. Uh, here you see our vehicle, Stanley, uh, going through the Mojave Desert. Um, at speeds of about 38 miles per hour, um, straight on a, on a big open road. Um, the type of terrain that you find in these places is very varied between nice and easy drivable terrain. We call this grade one terrain, all the way to grade five terrain, which has big ruts that you have to navigate around. This is a, uh, a river, a dry river a bed uh, full of sand. And in a second, you'll see an obstacle avoidance maneuver where this little bush here is being detected by the lasers and the vehicle in some very German way drives around this. Not elegant, but effective, uh, using the techniques I just showed you. Um, the data that comes in uh, looks very much like this. This is the same laser display I showed you before, um, just with real data for now from, from an actual uh, desert trail. Uh, these are four different lasers colored differently. They're angled at different angles to, to have a further or, or, or a less reach. Uh, and they're being analyzed continuously for the occurrence of obstacles that leads to a um, map like this. Uh, where the coloring indicates the uh, kind of the threat level. White basically means drivable, red means not drivable, and gray, if you can see, it means uh, we don't know. You can also see the uh, GPS corridor being superimposed in blue here, and the simple, very, very simple uh, rollout mechanism or planning mechanism picking a trajectory that sometimes deviates from the core corridor of the GPS trail um, because uh, GPS data is not very accurate. Um, so planning uh, then just meant uh, rolling out a couple of trajectories and picking the one that works best, as shown over here. Um, we also uh, worried about uh, long-range perception. Uh, the laser itself could only look about 25 meters or so, which is not good for fast driving. You had to look further. So a lot of work on computer vision at the time. Uh, so we put a camera um, on the roof of the vehicle. And my class was asked to write a piece of software to find the road ahead. After about 50 years of artificial intelligence research, you'd assume this is a solved problem. So what you do is you pick up the paper on how to find a road and implement it. 
but there's no such paper, it turns out. Um, finding the vote is actually hard. So my students started implementing saying, oh, the vote must be light gray. But it turns out some roads are paved and then they're dark. Some of them are wet. Some of them are overgrown by grass, which makes them green. So color is not a good indicator of drivability. Then they said, well, maybe the road is the smoothest thing in the image. Smooth meaning that adjacent camera pixels are uh, as close as possible together. Um, so they implemented a smoothness detector. Uh, turns out it's also a bad idea. The smoothest thing in all these images is actually the sky. So you start driving towards the sky. <laughs> Um, so what they eventually did is uh, what we, we then call adaptive vision and which then later led to an entire DARPA program called LAGER um, whereby we used our laser uh, as a short range um, sensor for finding drivable terrain up to 25 meters or so and then we extracted from the laser uh, data a, a region that was drivable and used it as online training examples for a machine learning algorithm to find uh, a classifier that could classify the specific drivable terrain relative to the undrivable terrain using a mixture of Gaussian. In doing so, we could apply this classifier to the entire image and find road surfaces much further out. This is obviously not in 3D, it's only in 2D, so we could project it back into uh, our map uh, using a flat ground assumption, which often is false, but good enough for the specific application. But as these images show, even in terrain that has about a similar appearance, um, we are able to fairly accurately find um, a road, a road surface. Uh, the system uh, adapts about 10 times a second. It trains itself 10 times a second. So you're able to, to adapt to the lighting conditions and to the uh, ground conditions on, on, uh, in these uh, situations. Of course, sometimes the road surface changes and you can't uh, pre-learn that, but the effect on the car would be it would just slow down so the laser would be able to catch possible obstacles there. So um, just give you some other examples uh, from the initial race. These are some of my favorite videos here. Um, uh, UC Berkeley um, with his motorcycle made some good progress. Um, it turns out uh, controlling a motorcycle is really hard. Um, if, you, if you want to control a motorcycle and you, you want to turn, if you just turn the steering wheel, you fall. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to basically start falling and catch your fall as a way of turning a motorcycle. So Anthony Lewandowski recorded every single of his falls, which is several hundred, it turns out. Uh, my favorite is actually this one over here. Uh, you're gonna enjoy this. It's Anthony again. I have a lot of respect for Anthony, but he makes great videos. <laughs> <laughs> so the first competition um, took place 2005 and it came with a pre-qualification event um, in uh, near Los Angeles. Uh, where we see our car now driverless, driving by itself. Behind it is a chase vehicle by the government that has an, an emergency kill stop. And it was exposed to a number of obstacles that would resemble the type of thing you would actually find in the desert. Um, so there was a narrow gate, uh, which turned to be lethal for most robots. A abandoned other robot, this white car. Uh, Dapper actually bought a lot of scrap cars. Um, a high speed area where you could drive as fast as you wished. We're driving about 38 miles per hour, which was our max speed. Uh, we weren't the fastest, turns out, uh, when it comes to max speed, but we were able to completely stop and swerve around obstacles at that speed, and it's actually fairly fast if you're inside a robot on a desert trail. And then the most important obstacle coming up in a second uh, was an uh, immolated tunnel uh, where our GPS receivers would fail. There were several underpasses under I-5, they were very narrow and long, so this was an emulation of this uh, over here. Uh, the difficulty being, can you navigate even in the, abs in the, in the absence of GPS? Just to give you a feeling as to how difficult this competition was, here are some of our not so fortunate competitors. Um, this is a video that Nova compiled. Nova is a documentary company. Um, this is um, a team that actually made it to the race, uh, but in this specific instance uh, dug itself a little nest. Um, the, uh, the Berkeley motorcycle was there again. It was actually figured out how to do controls, <laughs> but not how to do perception. <laughs> so the stereo system that didn't work. But Anthony, in its uh, wise uh, anticipation of this, had added little extra wheels, and the motorcycle was able to, to raise from the dead <laughs> and <laughs> bravely forge on. <laughs> These guys had a little software bug. Every, whenever they lost GPS, they went into high-speed mode to regain GPS as fast as possible. So they came out of the tunnel at 65 miles per hour. This is the only injury we had. The person actually had to uh, had small uh, scratches. Um, Carnegie Mellon, which was the big team, and by far, uh, one could say even the best team, um, clearly the, the favorite team uh, of many, um, at some point had a calibration error and, and, and ran over hay bales, which of course we taped. Uh, the, the Carnegie Mellon 
leader said there's not a big problem, a hammer can go over heavy else, but they got some penalties. But more interesting is this other field of vehicles that didn't make it and even wouldn't be able to ne negotiate the first gate. It was quite amazing to see how difficult it actually is to build robots that can do this, um, even avoid very big obstacles like, like this one over here. Um, or this one, there's now two unmanned vehicles moving uh, and so on, um, stuck in the tunnel, what have you. Uh, <laughs> Um, so let me just report a little bit from the race that's now about four years ago, actually. Um, race started at 6.30 in the morning. Um, we got our race coordinates two hours before the race, um, and we were all lined up to hear the national anthem and get ready for, for starts. Carnegie Mellon had two robots in the race. We just did one, and they found a, a loophole in the rules that allowed them to, to feed multiple robots. Uh, they also had the first-placed robot in the race. They went out first, a Highlander. Did a very nice job. Stanley went second. Uh, they started in five minutes intervals. It was a, a staggered start. It's not a first arrival race. It's more a, um, a time race. Um, and then Stanley, without a driver inside, basically went out, followed by its chase vehicle, into the desert. And we were standing there looking at the robots disappearing and realizing it's a big race going on and we have no, not, no role to play. It's basically we've been done. Your robot does his own race. It was a very bizarre feeling. So we, we went back to the big tent. Uh, I know Larry Page was there, Steve Wozniak, a couple of Silicon Valley celebrities. We had some champagne, and then and you wonder what's going on, right? So you couldn't really tell. Uh, the feelings are really interesting because I spent so much time with this machine. Um, I really became my, my friend, almost like my child. So, so the best comparison I have is with those of you who have children at the age of college, it's like sending a child to college, right? So, so you've worked on this really hard for 18 years, or in our case, 18 months. And you really want to make it perfect, so you, you want to give it every piece of wisdom you have about life. And then they have to go out there themselves and, and do their own thing. Um, and all you see is something like this, which is the, the web map. Um, so so the, the thoughts that you have is uh, hopefully the world comes back without scratches, without dents, or if it's a college kid, um, non-pregnant, whatever. I mean, you care about that these robots come back. So this is uh, Caltech uh, running into a little disagreement about GPS waypoints. Um, this is Team Dad getting stuck behind bushes. Um, the next team you'll see is a team that actually uh, worked really well, but had a, uh, a strapped on laptop, that, and the straps came loose, so the laptop fell off. Uh, that killed all of collision avoidance. And Carnegie Mellon, even though they were faster than us, uh, ran into this impasse, which we believe is related to a switching of fuel tanks. Uh, the vehicle shut down its engine, it restarted itself, it slid down a hill, and became slower, and eventually uh, the air conditioning broke. Um, which gave us a leading edge in the race. So we didn't win because we were better. We won because of a lucky incident by Carnegie Mellon. Um, be it as it is, we were able to, to reduce the five-minute distance to a much shorter distance. And at mile 102, we were afforded the possibility to pass Carnegie Mellon's vehicle, which was paused for the passing operation. Uh, pauses didn't count time-wise against those teams. So here's video from our vehicle as we approach Carnegie Mellon's obstacle. And this is the only man-made obstacle we encountered in the race, and we successfully drove around it, as you can tell. Uh, and then uh, our robot Stanley became the leading robot in the race. Here you see Stanley descending on a treacherous mountain pass called Beer Bottle Pass. Uh, it's a fairly steep mountain. On the left, there's a cliff that goes all, all the way 200 feet, roughly. On the right, there's a mountain. Uh, so now, now Stanley has to make uh, life or death decisions. Uh, the, at this point, the sensors are completely covered in dust, so it sees almost nothing, which means it goes faster. But it has a little controller built in that looks at the ruggedness of the terrain itself to slow it down. This goes about 10, 15 miles per hour, followed by the DARPA chase vehicle. We could actually see this live in the tent. There was a, uh, a television transmission into the tent, so we could see it descend. And after the descent was complete, we knew we had a chance the world would actually be able to come back. Um, we went outside to receive our robot. We first saw a couple of helicopters, and then we saw a dust cloud, eventually a, a blue dot. And about six hours, 53 min minutes, and 11 seconds into the race, uh, Stanley became the first robot to ever finish a challenge of this magnitude, and also the, the winner of the Dabra Grand Challenge, as shown over here. So this is us on the right side celebrating, and on the left side was Carnegie Mellon not celebrating. Uh, um, again, I think uh, we won by a lucky incident uh, more than anything else. Um, so DARPA, um, and this is now coming to the planning part of the talk, uh, issued a new challenge that was more complex. Uh, after uh, finishing desert driving, which didn't really require any planning, uh, the, the, the goal was on for doing some, some work on, on regular urban driving. Uh, think about the following. Think about your truck driver who uh, delivers parcels uh, or packages, and you have to go to a number of points to make these deliveries. 
your, your problem now is to able to pick a route. Uh, if a route doesn't work, turn around and pick a new route and do all this planning work on what lane you're on, how fast you go autonomously so you can able to deliver these routes. Um, I'm going to show you three slides on other stuff before I come to the planning part. Um, here's our vehicle, um, Junior. It's now a, a Passat, not a, a, a Touareg anymore. On top of Junior is this, this sensor over here, which is our main navigation sensor. It's a scanning laser um, with 64 scan lines. You see it on the left, uh, turning about 10 hertz. And on the right side, you see a, a depiction of these uh, scans. There's 64 different lines being scanned 10 times a second together with the analysis as to what an obstacle, uh, where the obstacles are. We're able to find even curbs that are about this, this tall using some, some machine learning technology. Um, so you see obstacles in red. Um, this laser uh, enables a number of things. Um, one thing that I'm not going to talk about here much here has to do with localization, being able to take a prior map of the environment and do precision localization. GPS gives you about an error of about a meter, uh, even if you pay a lot of money. Uh, we have an error of about five centimeters, uh, which is required for precision driving in, in lanes, as shown over here. There's some probability distributions about posteriors and so on. Um, and the other thing we can do is tracking other cars, using particle filters to track other cars. So here's an example of a display where other cars are facing us, a little bit fast forward, and you can see the other cars uh, being displayed uh, on the left side in our tracker. On the right side, you see a corresponding camera image uh, of the specific situation as we turn left over here. Um, so let's talk about uh, planning a little bit. Oh, here's a, here's a, a situation that really characterizes the complexity of the operations involved. Uh, this is a uh, part of the uh, national qualification event where our car has to do left turns into traffic. Uh, it's waiting uh, at the intersection. It's completely autonomous. Uh, you can see relatively narrow lanes and a couple of uh, courageous stunt drivers driving around. As the gap is big enough, our vehicle is, is, makes a decision to descend uh, into uh, the lane, take a left turn, and then it has to stay focused on the left turn uh, uh, on this lane and, and accommodate this oncoming traffic, which of course looks, looks dangerous to a robot. Uh, looks like normal human driving to some extent, but that's about the state of the art, I think, in terms of uh, in traffic driving capabilities today. So let me talk about planning a little bit. Um, planning was actually necessary, not at the level of complexity of your work, but of, of some level of complexity. Uh, to deal with the choice that the vehicle actually had in, in picking the right road uh, and, and making choices along the way. And I'm going to tell you about three different levels of planning that was that we invoked. Uh, one is global mission planning, one is a tactical normal driving planning, which is very related to what I showed you before, and one is a freestyle planning mode that was actually really important for some of the maneuvers we had to do. Um, global planning is simple. You can go into a store and buy a TomTom -tom or a Garmin and you get a global, global planner. Um, the way we did this is by dynamic programming. Say there is a um, mission goal over here that you wish to reach, and you wish to reach it in a way that you're facing north on this display. Um, then you can propagate values uh, through the graph of, network of, of the road network uh, uh, that gives you kind of an expected time of arrival. Uh, and if you look at the coloring of the graph, then it's obviously better to be over here facing this direction than being over here because you're further away. In fact, you can propagate the information along multiple lanes and even anticipate that certain lanes have, have turning constraints, and those will have higher or lower value depending on the turning constraints. So a sweep of dynamic programming solves your global path planning problem. It's slightly generalization over what a, a regular personal navigation device would offer you uh, in terms of finding a shortest route. And so that's actually a fairly trivial problem. Um, once you have done the uh, dynamic programming, you can combine the idea of rollouts uh, with dynamic programming, which is uh, you can do an analysis of your choices. You can roll out on this lane over here, and this lane over here, there's discrete choice points like turning points or go straight, or like over here you can do a discrete lane change. And then there's these more continuous uh, obstacle avoidance maneuvers I talked about before. Be it as it is, you can take these rollouts, compute a cost in terms of time it will take to get there, and then at the end of these uh, rollouts, you can connect to your dynamic programming table to understand how much cost is left to all the way to the goal. And that way you combine momentary traffic situations like being stuck behind this car over here with a more global perspective and find the globally optimal route given the knowledge that you have. Uh, so here's a typical situation. Uh, in this specific instance, you wish the uh, vehicle to turn right. There's a waypoint. You can see the different rollouts. Uh, there's a stop sign over here, so it has to obey a stop situation. Uh, check where the intersection is free. And we put the uh, target point to the left lane, so you can see uh, the turn is immediately followed by a lane shift. And now it's reaching the target point, as indicated by this orange circle over here. 
uh, you can actually um, mess with the cost factors very easily in these, in these settings. For example, if you penalize lane shifts and make them very expensive, then your dynamic programming propagation will propagate differently. It, it makes lane shifts more expensive. In this specific instance, there happens to be a sequence of motions that avoid a lane shift altogether, which means you go straight, you go left, you go left, you go left again, and eventually you find yourself in the other lane without having ever executed a lane shift as shown over here. So this gives you some flexibility in, 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 in making certain maneuvers more or less expensive. Um, you can see now taking another left turn and then eventually it takes a, another left turn. This is all on Stanford's campus. Um, and, and it uh, arrives uh, at its target location. That's fairly trivial, but it's a really good basic system to make navigation basically optimal, to integrate momentary situations like being stuck behind other cars uh, with a more global perspective on, on shortest path. Um, here's a situation where we have a moving obstacle. We can, of course, track the speed of moving obstacles. We make calculations. It turns out this vehicle has to turn right in the end, but it calculates that by moving to the left lane, it has more free space uh, to move faster, so the total time will be shorter, even given the penalty of lane shifts. We put a, a stop vehicle on the left side just to make the task a little bit harder, but you can see how the vehicle then plans its way around it. Um, the real challenge, however, um, was not to get stuck, especially given that there's about 15 other robots that will be crazy. Uh, and you would anticipate situations like those where we had to do a left turn, but none of the eligible, eligible trajectories would ever give us a solution. So to do this, we had a hierarchy of behaviors where we first drove like a German and then like an Italian. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Let me rephrase this. We, we first drove according to rules, and then we're willing to break all the rules by invoking a more freestyle uh, planning uh, algorithm, which I'll tell you about in a second, um, a relatively straightforward extension of A star. Um, so you can, you can see as, as you drive these environments, there will be many, many situations where you might find yourself stuck. So we'd eventually shed all the rules and drive just shortest path, and that was it. Uh, here's some situations from the NQEs uh, that really require this. On the left side, you see a road blockage, as shown by these little red dots. DABA put traffic cones all over the place. Okay? That clearly would make you go stuck if you follow the rules of the road, so you had to do some freestyle planning. On the right side, you see a parking maneuver, where the task is to uh, reach a parking spot that's confined by other vehicles, as shown over here. <coughs> and you can see a general purpose uh, path planner now, executing maneuvers that even involve backups. On the left side, the vehicle is now probing a lane shift into the opposite lane, oncoming lane, and after a timeout there, decides to move into a freely planned multi-point U-turn. It's not the U-turn you and I would choose. It looks very comical, but it does turn the vehicle around, and at some planning metric is actually optimal. And you can see the car on the right side here having executed its parking maneuver, being able to back out of it, and then and go on. This clearly required a, a level of understanding and planning, path planning, that is more general than the work I've previously discussed. Um, so you can see it move on and, and take its turn. It's very painful to see it in reality. It takes forever, but so is life. Um, in the bottom, you see a parking maneuver. If this plays, no, it didn't play, uh, from the race itself. Let's see, this should play. Um, this is taken from the race itself, where the car had to uh, turn into a side stub road over here. And then these are all parking spots. And there was a designated parking spot for the specific event. I think it's on the left side somewhere. Um, and our car had to move over these big open parking lots and find its way around. Um, so the question became, how can you build a planning system and motion planning system that allows the vehicle to do this? Uh, critical R has to be executable, continuous, of course, and has to be really fast. So in the end, the, the longest this would ever take would be in the order of 200 milliseconds. So let's talk about um, planning a little bit. Oops. Um, so here's a typical situation on a parking lot where we have an initial state uh, in heading direction and we have a, a goal state. Velocities are uh, irrelevant here, although we do planning in velocity space as well. Um, and maybe the optimal trajectory uh, goes down here and takes a U-turn or the back up and backs into this parking lot over here. Uh, of course, the map changes all the time, so you can't have a fixed map. As you drive, you, you see more obstacles, so you have to be able to, to react to this. Um, the classical planning paradigm goes back to Nils Nilsson, I guess, at Stanford many years ago, 
A star, or total stenosis D star, which are often being applied to these problems, has a couple of problems. I'll show you the first one. It has to do with the discretization of the world. If you discretize into X, Y, and theta, um, you only get a discrete plan, which is not executable. As this one over here, a car cannot go at a right angle, even though this might be close to the shortest path. Uh, field D star by um, my student Dave Ferguson and Tony Stenz um, doesn't quite resolve it. It's an algorithm that uh, looks at linear interpolations uh, between border crossings of cells, but they still have these discontinuities over here. So the very first thing is we extended A star to become a continuous planning algorithm. And the logic was very simple, which was if you expand your nodes uh, into a new cell in A star, you memorize along the way the continuous coordinates in which you entered that cell, which is, of course, more than the cell index itself. It's the continuous coordinates inside the cell. And as you now move on to expand next time, you use these coordinates as a starting point and execute an actual physical robot action, a real turn, and a real um, move forward to reach the next cell. And as you just memorize these points over here, uh, you will be able to extract from A star a continuous trajectory that is drivable. It's not complete. Um, it is uh, not optimal. It might miss plans. But if you find a path, then you'd be guaranteed it's executable by the robot, and it's feasible uh, kinematically for the robot to execute this plan in the real world, given the obstacles. Um, we call this hybrid A star. What it, what it does is gives you a, a path like this over here, um, as shown over here. It's not a very smooth path, but it's, uh, it searches globally for the optimal path, obviously. Um, it's also very slow, it turns out, because the, the state space is three-dimensional. It's very large for any, any reasonable discretization. So the very first thing we then did is uh, try to make it faster. We made it faster by uh, heuristics, of course. And we could just think of two types of heuristics that, that work together like a charm. Uh, the first one is an, an offline calculated heuristic that, that is just uh, adheres to the, the specific geometry of cars. And the second one is an, is an online um, heuristic. Um, let me talk about the offline heuristic first. Um, say you wish to reach this parking position up here, facing down. Then a simple A star planner, using uh, Euclidean distance as a heuristic, as we've all learned in the textbooks, would expand, as shown over here, and would equally expand on the top and the bottom. Uh, the reason is these are points very close to the target location in XY space, but not in the orientational space. The car is, is basically the wrong way around. So if you if you factor in the orientational space, you can pre-compute a distance table of a strictly admissible heuristic um, of, of a distance that doesn't overestimate the true distance uh, that really factors in that from over here to get the car to there pointing down, you have a very long distance. You can, for each grid cell uh, in, in the A star table, pre-calculate what maneuver it would take in the shortest possible way to turn, to turn the car around. And this will strongly favor cells over here because those take a very short turn to get to the target location, whereas those take a long maneuver to turn the car around into the right position. So when, when you just pre-calculate this and give it as a general heuristic for reaching a point, it penalizes all the search space over here and expands over here. So this is a reduction of, of nodes expanded up there. The second heuristic is an online heuristic. It turns out if you weren't dealing with a car, but with a holonomic robot, like a uh, holonomic base, for example, you could easily just do the entire planning in XY space and forget about orientation, right? If you plan in XY space, then you find an admissible heuristic for your planning problem, which is you find a shortest path for a holonomic robot, which, of course, is much more tickly than your non-holonomic car, um, and then you can use it as a lower bound of the distance to go. So in this specific instance, say you want to go over here, but there's a big band of obstacles over here, a Euclidean distance would search over here and search over here. But if you pre-compute in 2D, which is really, really fast, um, XY, um, what your distance to the goal is basically value iteration in 2D, it takes no time, uh, then you penalize the search space over here because your 2D search already concluded to go from here to there, even with the holonomic base, you have to go over, around all the way here. So, so it, a simple 2D search just an XY space, not looking at orientation, uh, that's, of course, exponentially faster, so to speak, um, gets you a really good heuristic. So you put these two things together, and all of a sudden, your number of node expanded go down dramatically. Still doesn't work, OK? It's a little more work, OK? Next problem we face is we need precision uh, at the target location. So you discretize maybe at two or three degrees angularly and maybe 50 centimeters spatially. But if you plan on that, that resolution, uh, you, you end up 
typically close to the goal, but not close enough to be acceptable for the rules of the competition. Uh, so here is an initial location and a target location. And what this symbolizes is if you really have a very tight constraint how, how accurate you want to be in your target location, um, you will end up expanding many more nodes because you just won't reach it, turns out. So it's kind of a flaw in the way this hybrid A star uh, mechanism processes information. Um, it turns out there's a really nice theory called reed shep curves, which some of you might know, which for cars of the type we're discussing, they're like bicycle style cars, like one, one axle is movable, the other one is static, uh, devises a method for finding optimal paths or finding uh, admissible curves uh, to any goal location in the absence of any obstacle. And it's really fast. It's like a closed form uh, solution. So what you can do is you can take this algorithm as a subroutine in your planning process at any point in time, ask yourself, find me a path to my goal location ignoring all obstacles. And if you find one, you're done. And you, you have it at arbitrary precision. You have it at perfect precision. Um, so um, in a situation like this over here, where planning would take a, a huge expansion tree uh, because we can't reach the goal at our criteria of, of accuracy, this one over here goes and expands. Anytime it expands a node, checks whether a shape read curve would, would lead you to a, um, to a shortest path. Those over here will, of course, intersect with the obstacle, will be found to be invalid. But this one over here gets to the point where this very simple analytic algorithm finds you a path to the goal, and then your planner just stops and declares victory. Um, so that cuts from your planning complexity and also gives you uh, an ability to really get to your target locations with perfect precision uh, relative to the planning problem. Um, the last thing we did is, um, which I'll tell you about, is path smoothing. It turns out these paths generated by this now somewhat um, modified A star algorithms aren't very smooth. Uh, this would be a typical path over here, depending how your coordinate system is aligned, uh, your discretization works, you get approximate paths. But if you drive this, then it feels really like a drunk squirrel. Um, so we had a desire to make it a little bit smoother. So we came up with a smoothing formula over here. It has a number of different constraints, turning radius constraint, smoothness constraint, a collision avoidance constraint, and a Voronoi field, which I'll tell you about. And the typical answer of smoothing would be a trajectory like this over here. So it's a, it's a post-processing step of the path to make it as smooth as possible. It would be a local optimizer, so it couldn't find a topologically different path, but it can take a topological path like this one and straighten it out um, in typically five milliseconds. Um, one of the problems we encountered is, um, uh, leads to this idea of Voronoi fields um, had to do with the fact that we try to stay away from obstacles. And uh, often this is done by potential fields. Um, it's a very old technique, of course, um, very nice technique. We did a minor modification to potential fields where we try to rescale the amount of propelling uh, force uh, from an obstacle relative to the distance uh, of, of a clearing space. So say you have two obstacles that are really far away, like here, then you wish to have a strong force away, so you want to have a lot of clearance. But if these obstacles are really nearby, you wish to have a small force pulling you away and not a strong force. Um, that was achieved by running a Voronoi uh, decomposition of our data, which we would run regularly. Um, the, the white stuff is the obstacles. You can see the Voronoi uh, decomposition and the Voronoi graph in the center. Uh, then you can measure for any point what's the clearance. So you basically find the nearest uh, Voronoi line, graph line, and ask itself, uh, ask on this line what's the clearance relative to the nearest obstacle. You find that the clearance here is much, much less than, say, over here. And then you just rescale your obstacle repellent force in your, um, in your uh, potential field in accordance to this, which means um, effectively the cost of going through a narrow opening is identical to the cost of going through a wide opening over here in the center. And you, you, you fold this into your smoothing, and that basically puts you, pushes you away uh, from obstacles uh, just fine, uh, even if some of these openings are very wide and some of these openings are very, very narrow. Um, we call this Voronoi field. It's a minor modification, of course, on a huge literature on, on um, uh, potential field navigation. So here's a typical situation. This is in simulation um, to make it a little bit harder. And any of these planning steps uh, take no more than about 0.2 seconds. And I believe we were by far the fastest planning algorithm in the competition, certainly much faster than Carnegie Mellon's. Uh, you can see the expansions. The expansions only occur when a smoothing of the existing trajectory fails, like right now. Um, for example, we find new obstacles, and all of a sudden, what looked uh, drivable becomes undrivable. And then the planning occurs using the various heuristics I told you and smoothing techniques. In this case, they involve backups, of course. You can easily fold a backup into your planning algorithm. Um, 
The nice thing is the smoothing itself takes in the order of 10 milliseconds. It's really, really fast using conjugate gradient uh, on a regular Pentium computer. And uh, the uh, replanning using A star in this three-dimensional space takes no more than 200 milliseconds. In the actual competition, it took much far shorter because there wasn't anyways complex as this set of shoeboxes over here. But even in this complicated environment, um, the planning speed is actually relatively fast. And you can see it doesn't, doesn't plan very often. It only plans when the most promising trajectory can't be smoothed anymore. And then even when it plans, like over here, the planning might be very, very short because of these curves that I showed you before. As soon as it reaches the point over here, it can analytically solve the problem, how to get there. And now it's backing up a little bit. Um, so I understand that you are more sophisticated than I am when it comes to planning. Um, and I hope I, 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 I still conveyed some interesting information here in terms of vehicle planning. Um, it's not anywhere as good as strips planning or high-level mission planning, the work that you do. But for this specific task, um, this actually really solved the problem for us. And we were able to have a really, really fast path planner that really worked reliable. Um, so let me show an example uh, in reality. This is an example we really staged on Stanford's parking lot, uh, where we asked the car to actually, the only way to reach this point over here was to back up into an open parking spot over here. I don't know who owned this car, who owned that car over there, but they were gracefully acknowledged for the contributions to our research by risking their vehicles. You can see the car going in, and now you know I need precision. You can't do this with the discretization alone uh, to, to back up these, these, these narrow spots. And then um, you can see us go out, uh, and you can see the planning as it unfolds uh, right over here. Um, and of course, now the planning has suspended because the current trajectory is admissible and can be smooth to be uh, drivable only if it fi it's found to be non-drivable will the, the plan itself change. Here's a situation uh, on a parking lot. Um, where you can see um, Junior uh, navigating a couple of um, traffic cones. Um, and on the right side, you see the, the map display as it emerges. You don't see any plans here. On the left, you see our car pulling into the parking lot by itself. Um, so that's basically um, my story on planning. Um, and I welcome any discussion we could have on future planning challenges. I think if you, if you ask yourself uh, traffic, um, you find that there's many, many planning opportunities out there, uh, especially if you move away from one car to many cars and ask yourself about how to route traffic and so on. But this was good enough for the competition. Um, so let me talk about the event itself a little bit more um, and show you some video of the event and some of the things that didn't work. Um, we don't have much video of the event itself. This is um, footage of our car starting the race, and this is uh, footage taken over a fence. For the most part, we actually couldn't see the cars operating. Um, here you see an intersection where there's a human driver and another robot following. Um, we go first. Um, we had a, a logic to deal with stop signs that counted who was first and so on. You can see footage from inside the car a little bit. And uh, a parking maneuver as we move into a parking spot. Um, this is, I think, Caltech's robot stuck a little bit uh, behind, I think, MIT's robot. And you can see us um, going ahead. These are just momentary snapshots. We didn't win this race. We came in second. We, we finished first uh, in good old Stanford tradition. But right after us finished Carnegie Mellon, that it started about half an hour later. So they actually won the race. And I think I was really happy about this, because in the grand scheme of things, um, we won the first one by luck. So they, they won the second one well-deserved. And I think it's now even between us, even though we end up making more money, because this race had a million dollar for the second finisher, which we came in second. Um, and again, I think about six cars finished this race, which was quite, quite impressive. Um, let's see. Um, there was an accident. This was one of the accidents. This is MIT on the right side hitting uh, Cornell on the left side. Okay. So if you are an undergrad trying to apply for grad school, uh, MIT is certainly a high impact place. Um, <laughs> Um, and this was actually this was the first ever recorded traffic jam of robots. This is a display in the tent, and my uh, postdoc at the time, Mike Montemello, labeled um, the vehicles. There's actually four robots out there that are all stuck together in a traffic jam, and about five humans. Okay, uh, DARPA shut down the race for a while to clear up this traffic jam manually, and then they moved on. It turns out on the same day, the same morning, on California Route 99, there was a mass accident in fog involving more than 100 vehicles. Three people died. And this was actually a scene just an hour before the Grand Challenge race started, um, not, not far away. And these were all humans. So there's no robot involved. <laughs> OK. Um, some of the things we didn't solve, 
Okay, we didn't solve this problem. Um, <laughs> this is a, in some sense, a much more intricate problem because uh, there's many fewer rules. Uh, this is taken in daily from a hotel room. Um, it's actually interesting to, s to, to observe Indian traffic for a while. This is the way traffic works without rules. Um, <laughs> it's not entirely without rules. There is a rule, and the rule has to do with the mass of your vehicle. Um, if you're bigger, you go first. Pedestrians go last. Um, and there's a bit of an orientation uh, for traffic. You, you tr try to stay on your lane. Uh, not everybody does, like this motorcycle might go a different direction. But you can see the bus just plowing through and all the small ones, basically. So there are some rules. Um, another problem we didn't solve, at least so I thought until we recently solved it, is this one over here. Um, it has to do with um, really using your vehicle at its fullest potential. Okay? <laughs> so, for the longest time, I thought this is really interesting and really hard until Andrew Ng, my colleague, and his student Zico Kolter tried it out. And he has this wonderful work on reinforcement learning that you might know of. He gave the uh, uh, Computer and Thought Award talk on, on helicopter control. Um, so together, we, uh, we, we did the same thing. We did it backwards for various reasons. Um, this is now completely autonomous uh, for our car. <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. It turns out the, the most significant research cost these days for me is tires. <laughs> they get run down. And this is a problem I wish to solve, which is a real traffic scene uh, recorded by a traffic camera, which I haven't solved yet. So you have to look to the right side. It's hard to see. You have to look into this lane over here, okay, when I tell you. Okay. Look well now. <laughs> Everybody see it? Okay, this is actually recorded by traffic. This actually should be possible. There should be no reason why we're doing this. Like, there was, this is German precision, right? So we basically, the car fit perfectly well, right? And it's just us lousy drivers who can't really accommodate situations like these. Okay, um, I wanna uh, use my finishing slide to say a little bit more in context as to wh why I think this, this work uh, should be pursued by many of us and what the possible implications are. Um, if you look at um, traffic today, um, I would claim that the way we transport ourselves is horrendously inefficient. And you can compare it easily to the inefficiency of broadcast media and print media before the advent of the internet. Except that our automotive industry is not on an innovative path. They're basically on a retaining path to sell the same products over and over again. In fact, if you look at cars today, the way we use them, it's about the same as 50 years ago. There's no difference, right? They might have nicer rosewood and nicer leather. Now, let me just tell you some of the inefficiencies that I think we can solve with this technology. First, car accidents are the number one cause of death for young people, up to about my age, okay? It's, they cost us 1.2 million lives every year uh, in the world, and 98 or so percent are purely based on human error. It's like us texting while driving or on the cell phone. Let's see, whoever here has texted while driving? Ah. <laughs> I would assume pretty much everybody, right? <laughs> okay, um, certainly me. Um, it's getting worse in, in terms of distractions while driving and all the way off cell phones with text capabilities. Um, it's huge. Uh, I mean, many, many of us lost relatives or friends in traffic, and I'm sure some of you have been in traffic accidents before. Most of them are completely avoidable. Okay, so why on earth are we willing to accept this um, as a status quo? Okay, commuting. Um, think about the time you spend in your car. In the U.S., it's more than an hour per day for an average working person. Just doing the same stuff over again. This is not fun driving. This is basically being stuck in traffic behind an idiot who's in front of you, and and just driving the same course, to work and from work, just think about the lost time, how much time you could regain if your car could behave like a train on a highway and you could do something better than just staring at the road ahead. There's people who can't drive today, um, like blind people, elderly people. Elderly is a big issue in the United States and in Japan. Um, if, if you give up your ability to drive a car, you, you lose your independence, and that's very, very painful um, in high, high age. Typically, leads to relatively rapid deterioration um, ability to, to keep operating a car, even though your perception might degrade or your cognition might degrade, would really enable a huge number of people to have much higher quality of life, uh, I think. And it doesn't take a fully autonomous car. It just takes a few computer science inventions to get us there. Okay? You can affect literally millions of people 
and many millions more as the baby boomer generation moves into retirement age. Okay? Energy, there are some interesting statistics. If you take all of road traffic, you, you burn about 30% of the US energy in the United States. I don't know the statistics for Greece. It's significant. Okay? It turns out a lot of it is wasted. Um, so for example, if you take two trucks and let them drive at very close distance, like 10 meters, then they will save uh, the, the, the front vehicle will save about 11% of, it, of its gas, and the, the trailing vehicle about 21%, just by, by using wind drag as a way to, to propel yourself more efficiently. The numbers aren't quite as rosy for passenger cars, but in passenger cars, if you were to drive very closely together, like a train, like an, an autonomous highway train, uh, you could increase the package density of, of highways. Uh, right now, the package density of highways is really lousy. If you take a highway at what's called peak capacity, which means it, it has as many cars going through as possible. So cars are moving still fast. They're going about 80 kilometers per hour, 90 kilometers per hour. Um, but they're still densely packed. Okay? So it's not a complete train. And then take a picture from the air of this, of this highway. And then the picture asks yourself, how much of the physical real estate highway is actually occupied by cars? And how much of it is actually still visible and free? You can take a guess. In the US, only 8% of the highway will be taken by cars and 92% of the highway surface is the space in front of us and on the sides. Like the lanes are twice as wide as our car, and we're going to keep, I don't know, maybe 200 feet distance to the guy in front of us. Why? Because we are lousy drivers. We can't control our cars very well. So if you had a, a picture where these cars would drive closer together under robotic control, it's completely foreseeable that they could double the capacity of the highway system. In a country like the US, where highway use goes up 3% per year, and then there's literally no new highway construction, that would be a, a life changer. It would really retain the same traffic levels we have today for the next 30 years. There's no other invention that can basically de declog traffic other than what we're doing over here and still keep the growth uh, and productivity and transportation that we have witnessed in the last 30, 40 years in the United States. Let me talk about the last number, um, about cars themselves. Let's see who here owns a car. OK. Actually, huh? Three, five. Yes, here we go, two cars. Um, you should not own more cars than you have arms. Um, what is your car doing right now? Right? It's probably standing in some parking garage, right? Uh, that's pretty, pretty irresponsible. So you're tying up natural resources, not just in the form of your car, which you use at best 4% of its lifetime. It'll be, it'll be parked 96% of your lifetime. You're also uh, chewing up real estate, okay, heat. Um, building materials for your garage, and all these wonderful things. Half of Albuquerque, downtown Albuquerque is dedicated to parking and streets. Right? So the, half the real estate is, is just taken for transportation. Um, it's huge. Now, if you have cars drive themselves, you can completely change this. Okay? Um, and, and you can invent the zip car of the future, which is you go outside, um, you go to your iPhone, and you hit a button, and a self-driving car around you hears about the signal and comes up and picks you up and is available for transportation. So you could use the yield of, of cars could be much, much higher. They could be used 20, 30% of the time. Say you go up to 20%, you've cut the number of cars by a factor of five or so, okay? So you can have many fewer cars, no more parked cars. It doesn't work today because cars don't drive themselves. It, it doesn't work because like in the suburbs, everybody will want to move from, from the neighborhood in the morning to work and in the evening back home. It only works if this car is kind of randomly shoveled. But the moment you have the ability of the car to drive towards you, you can really change the game. You can have a rental car at the airport that comes to your curb, so no more going to the rental car counter type things. But most importantly, you can really start sharing cars. In doing so, you can really uh, save a lot of resources that are currently, in my opinion, badly wasted. And we never think about but they're really badly wasted. Cars and car-based transportation is the second largest expense for the American household. And they, they spend about a third of the income on transportation, it turns out. So it's also a big uh, money factor, a monetary factor to do this. For all these reasons, I think we should really push hard to, uh, to, to advance this application. There's very little funding going to this right now. The US uh, automotive industry is basically stuck with their current products. It's falling apart, as we know. I think it's an opportunity for us to be innovative. And this is a fundamental computer science problem. It's not a fundamental vehicle design problem. It's a computer science problem to enable cars to be smart enough to, to, to support us in different ways. I envision a future where we have safe transportation. We don't go to funerals anymore. 
Uh, we save a lot of money by, by having safe transportation because all these things cost money. We have convenient transportation. We can do something else. And we have efficient transportation. We can go much, much faster between points. And of course, we have inexpensive transportation by being able to share cars and so on. All these things are possible and should be done in the next couple of years if we all work together. So I invite everybody here and challenge everybody, uh, especially those of you who are looking for applications. Um, going to space is a fun application. It's important. This, if we do it well, will have an impact. I have one minute left. I want to acknowledge my team. And thank you. Um, let's, let's, let's answer the first question. There is work underway in, 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 in enabling car-to-car -car communication and car-to-environment communication. I choose not to emphasize it because it creates a bit of a chicken and egg problem. I don't want, we can't, we can't um, condition the deployment of this technology on vast infrastructure changes because no one's going to pay for this. So I think we have to do what early cars did when they, when they rode on horse trails and, and, and have the environment with the cars co-evolve. Um, in terms of the second one, I'm actually really curious to learn more about your work, to be honest, um, even though I have to go to the airport pretty soon. Because I think as we think more globally about optimizing traffic, uh, there's applications that could really benefit from some very good scheduling and planning. And the issues, I think, become computationally much more involved than the way I portray them today. Yeah, I, I don't have a good answer about how to guarantee anything. I mean, this is basically a couple of grad students um, driving me with their code through the environment, and I have an emergency stop button and we're debugging. Um, we have not done any error analysis of the components involved. Um, the, the system is also not marketable the way it is because it's way too expensive. It turns out this last car surely cost about half a million dollars. Um, I think we have to just apply proper engineering methodology to get there and it uh, requires significantly more investments to to be able to get certain assurances and certainly we need them if we deploy this technology. So this is just basically a first step to, to show what is principally possible and I think the industry has to pick it up and, and apply what's commonly applied. So there's no new challenges right now even though we are in, in conversation with the XPRIZE Foundation on a possible high-speed racing challenge. Um, my, my personal goal right now is to make this stuff happen. So I'm working on commercialization, on downcosting, on reliability. Uh, we've driven more miles autonomously, many more miles autonomously after the last challenge than before. And we're now driving regularly on 280 in traffic and so on. Um, we, are, we are gearing up for a mission from San Francisco to Los Angeles um, just to push the technology further. And, and we've made a number of inventions along the way. Yeah, so the liability right now is entirely in the operators of the car, which is nice, and they pay an insurance to get rid of the risk associated with liability. Uh, I think in the grand scheme of things, if this technology succeeds, we're going to reduce costs. And one of the entities that should have an interest in this is insurance companies, because they will reduce costs and, and possibly have higher profits. Um, we need new models. We can't uh, an entirely uh, use this technology all the way to the end and still keep the reliability entirely in the driver himself. But we, we, we spend about between about 1% to 2% of the GDP right now on traffic accidents and consequences. There's a lot of money. So if you're able to cut this down in half and so on, I think there's enough money left to really incentivize uh, manufacturers to purchase, purchase insurance and fold this back into the sales price. It's something to be worked out, I think. Uh, but I don't want to be hung up over existing uh, legal frameworks, even though those are important, 
in the invention of a visionary new technology. So the question is whether it be energy efficient? Yeah, I'm not familiar enough with the work on centralized coordination of multiple agents. And um, something tells me that anything you do here has to be somewhat decentralized because you're just not going to be able to communicate to a centralized node and make your actions depending on it. Um, I mean, I have a hunch that it's going to be more energy efficient, but a lot of things have to happen before this is actually implemented into an, a more energy efficient mode. Um, so for example, one thing I would love to see is these trains on highways that link up very closely and possibly maybe they get permission to go on special HOV lanes because they certainly have a much better yield than existing cars. And if you did this, you could drive much more regular, you could uh, exploit wind drag, and you would easily be 20% more energy efficient than today's best operation, 30% more energy efficient. Uh, I think that there's perception, I've talked a lot to uh, a person in the Obama administration about this, uh, that this technology, if it was available, would be very attractive to, to pursue. Uh, of course, it's not available today. Um, and I, these are really hard questions, and I'm sure five years from now I have different answers than I have today. But yeah. <laughs>